Well, good evening and welcome to the April Book Club of the Month of the Western Cuyahoga uh, Audubon Society, where through our readings and sharing ideas, we can find knowledge and discover wonder, and we can work toward the WCAS mission to connect, educate, and conserve. My name is Drina Nemes. I'm a relatively new member to the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, drawn to it by my love for birds. And recently, I've been retired after 45 years as a nurse, and I was ready for an activity like a book club, especially being about birds and nature and the environment. This book group just began last September. Gloria Ferris was the host. And Betsy O'Hagan is a technology wizard and collaborator. <laughs> and out of the limitations of the pandemic, they created this virtual book club with two programs per month. On the third Sunday of the month, uh, has been devoted to having an author, often from Ohio. And they have an opportunity to share their stories as well as share their books. And this has been such a wonderful opportunity for us. And on the fourth Sunday, we discuss and share ideas from those books that we personally are enjoying and recommend. And this discussion has led to a, a wide variety of topics and introduction to new authors. I'd like to say thank you to Gloria and to Betsy for their planning and launching of the book club. Um, Gloria has recently retired. And as I had attended um, most of the book club meetings, I was asked if I'd like to serve as the host, and I said yes. And I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to welcome everyone who is here. And also, I'd like to especially welcome Katie, um, our speaker. Um, she is the founder, as you may know, of the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia which is located close to Morgantown, uh, West Virginia. And this center provides wildlife rehabilitation for part of West Virginia and Ohio and Pennsylvania. Um, currently, Katie teaches nonfiction uh, in the MFA programs at Chatham University and West Virginia University uh, and West Virginia University and Wesleyan College. I hope I have that right. Um, uh, we were fortunate also to have Katie speak at our book club last October, uh, and she featured her book with a wonderful title, Vultured, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird. It was a fascinating program. I had a chance to listen to some podcasts that Katie has produced over the last couple of years, and I heard one with Bill Thompson from Birders Digest. and. It was uh, devoted to her book about the vultures, and he referred to Katie as the vulture evangelist. Now, while, before, while Katie was getting interested in vultures, as I understand the sequence, she got totally involved and immersed with cerulean warblers, and they kind of took over her, her life for a period of time. And if Bill Thompson were still around, I understand that he has, he's not, he's no longer with us, but if he were here, he would call her the Cerulean Evangelist. And after reading your book, Katie, I can say, yes, that you are a Cerulean Evangelist. So I can't wait to hear about your book. Well, thank you very much, Strina, and thank you, Betsy, and thank you, um, thank you very much for um, inviting me uh, to speak to you today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, here we go. Start sharing my screen. Uh, so let me know if you can see the yeah. beautiful cerulean warbler. Yes. Excellent. All right, there we go. Wow. Um, and if something strange happens with the technology, um, let me know, but uh, hopefully we'll be fine. So, um, again, like Drina said, I'm Katie Fallon. I'm excited to be here. 
I love talking about birds of all species, but especially uh, cerulean warblers and uh, vultures. <laughs> when vultures I talked about a few months ago um, with the book club, and today I'll be talking about cerulean warblers, my other favorite species, um, which is a little strange. Cerulean warblers are uh, small, declining, you know, very beautiful, where turkey vultures um, are large, maybe um, increasing in number, and some people think they are less beautiful <laughs> than, a, than a cerulean warbler, but um, they're both very important species for different reasons. So, um, let's go ahead here and, and um, talk about this bird. So about, it's, it's, it's been about uh, ten, 10 years or so, 10 years ago I wrote this book, um, Cerulean Blues, A Personal Search for a Vanishing Songbird. And I started writing about vultures first, and then the ceruleans took over for, uh, for several years. And then I went back to vultures um, after uh, writing the cerulean book. So I kind of, maybe I'll go back to ceruleans again next. But um, I first got interested in cerulean warblers, I think, in maybe 2000 or 2001, when I went to a local presentation a presentation on our local Audubon Club by uh, given by a biologist who studied cerulean warblers. And I went mostly because I was interested in uh, learning about the species that was in steep decline um, in the same region where I was living, which was West Virginia, where I, where I still live um, now. And I, I, after hearing this biologist speak about the kind of plight of the cerulean warbler, I thought, you know, somebody should write a book about that. Um, but I didn't really think it would be me. Um, I was in graduate school at the time, and uh, uh, it just seemed like writing a book about something was, was in my future. But I started to do some research, and in 2007, I learned that the cerulean warbler had been denied threatened status under the Endangered Species Act even though they were the fastest declining neotropical uh, migratory songbird um, in North America. Um, so I thought, you know, how, how could that be that a bird that was in such steep decline was uh, not considered threatened or endangered? So I wanted to investigate it further, and that investigation um, kind of turned into this book, uh, which came out in 2011. So... Uh, and then um, a year, this is, this is May of 2019, which was really the last time we were allowed to have bird festivals. <laughs> um, this is at the New River Birding and Nature Festival, which is in southern West Virginia uh, in the New River Gorge area. And now um, some of you may know that there is a new state park, or sorry, national park, New River Gorge National Park, just was um, made a national park a few months ago. Anyway, the New River Birding and Nature Festival um, has happened uh, for the last maybe 15 years or so. And I've been a guide there for the last um, maybe 9 or 10 years. And last year, or geez, 2019, it feels like it was last year, uh, we caught a cerulean warbler in the mist nets that were set up at the festival. And this is um, Dr. Bill Hilton, who's a bird bander from South Carolina, who sets up the nets. And this is the first time that he had caught a cerulean in the mist net. And uh, my husband said, you should go get a copy of your book and introduce the cerulean to the book. So <laughs> uh, so it was a little silly, but we had to do it. So anyway, um, now to talk about the bird itself and not, not just um, my obsession with it. So this photograph is one of, one of one I like to start with because... This is southern West Virginia, uh, so this is sort of the heart of the cerulean warbler's uh, breeding range. Um, this is probably uh, Raleigh County or Kanawha County or Boone County, West Virginia, um, south of Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, and I took this photograph from um, a small airplane um, that flew low over the, over the region sort of to give, uh, give us a sense of what the landscape uh, looked like. Um, and this was the only picture I, I had from my trip that didn't have, you know, too many signs of humans in it. It just sort of looked like um, those old Appalachian mountains um, covered with a nice hardwood forest. 
So this this slide has more words than most of the other slides, so don't be don't be worried. Most are <laughs> most are pictures, but um, stuff that we that we need to know. So the cerulean warbler, it's one of our fastest declining neotropical migratory songbirds. It's probably the fastest declining, um, although there are other species that are declining almost as fast or as fast, um, like the golden wing warbler. Uh, and there are several other species of um, songbirds that are declining quite quite rapidly. Um, a lot of our grassland birds are, are in steep decline as well. Um, but the cerulean warbler is probably the fastest one that's uh, fastest declining neotropical migrant. Uh, neotropical migrants, uh, of course, are those birds that may breed here in North America and then spend the winter months in the tropics. Uh, and it's anything that eats insects, mostly. So uh, your, our warblers, uh, thrush, a lot of our thrushes, um, hummingbirds, of course, um, are neotropical migrants. Uh, Broadwing hawks are neotropical migrants. They all leave our region. Um, Orioles, uh, flycatchers, most of those species go to the tropics, uh, either Central or South America. Um, so the cerulean warbler has declined by about 3% a year since 1966, which is when they first started counting. So the cerulean population is 70 to 80 percent smaller than it was um, at that time, which is a very steep and sort of alarming decline. Um, the vast majority of cerulean warblers, greater than 70 percent, breed in central Appalachia. So that's uh, roughly from Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania to eastern Tennessee and eastern Kentucky, um, some of Ohio. Um, all of West Virginia, some of southwestern Virginia, 70% um, of all the ceruleans breed in that, that region. There are uh, locally common area, areas where ceruleans are locally common outside that core range. Um, there are ceruleans in Ontario, um, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut has some ceruleans, Missouri has some ceruleans, um, but they are sort of more uh, more patchy in those areas. Really, the vast majority is in the mountains and, and central Appalachia. Uh, what I find really interesting, and one of the things I love about ceruleans, uh, more than more than 30 percent, um, probably closer to 35 or 36 percent of all cerulean warblers breed in West Virginia, um, which is more than any other state. Our state bird is the northern cardinal. <laughs> Um, along with, you know, six other states, I believe, but I think we should change that <laughs> um, because uh, the cerulean warbler is really a really special bird and we have, you know, uh, more than a third of the global population breeds in West Virginia, which is really amazing. We also have more um, wood thrush than any other state. Uh, I think Pennsylvania, I think, is a really close second. Um, in, in this region, central Appalachia, ceruleans prefer to nest in large tracts of mature to old growth hardwood forests on ridges. Um, they like uh, a canopy that's, that's patchy and fairly a diverse canopy structure, so some really tall trees, some smaller trees, uh, some vines in the middle. They don't like sort of this closed canopy. They like a forest that's sort of um, uh, a, a canopy structure that um, has some different different layers, if that makes sense. So if you think of a very old forest where you would have some really large, big, super emergent old trees and then some smaller trees kind of around them um, and then some gaps in the canopy like where a big old tree would fall down. Um, those are the kind of forests that ceruleans like. Uh, ceruleans also can be found in um, hardwood forests in river valleys. Uh, the Ohio River Valley, Mississippi River Valley used to have a lot of cerulean warblers um, back when um, John James Audubon was uh, going out and um, documenting where different species of birds were found. He noted a lot of them in the river valleys, in those big forests in the river valleys, and unfortunately a lot of those forests are gone. Uh, but ceruleans can sometimes be found in forests in river valleys also, uh, like big old sycamore trees. So um, this is uh, just a range map from um, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that just shows where ceruleans are. So the orange is where ceruleans breed. Uh, you can see there are some patchy orange areas, places besides um, central Appalachia. And I, uh, I sort of 
you know, forgot Michigan has some, um, and some of those other uh, other states, sort of in that that great those Great Lakes states. Uh, you'll notice the yellow is their migratory this, the migratory path. So you may see ceruleans in some other areas during migration. Even though this looks like from this map uh, that ceruleans you know travel along the Gulf Coast, most biologists agree that they are a trans-Gulf migrant. Um, although interestingly, some geolocator data, some biologists have been able to put very very tiny geolocators on male ceruleans to see, try to figure out exactly where they go on migration. It's, it's kind of labor intensive because you have to recatch the same birds and take the geolocators off them and then download the data to figure it out. So it's not as easy as putting a big solar transmitter on a turkey vulture, <laughs> you know, or an eagle. Um, but they learned that on the fall migration, the birds were moving um, somewhat more slowly than spring, and they, they had only four male birds in this study um, that was done in southern Indiana. Uh, of the four male ceruleans that they were able to recapture, two of them flew right across the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico from sort of the uh, Mississippi River Delta area across the Gulf to Central America, whereas two of them crossed over Cuba. Uh, which was interesting and unexpected. But then on the spring migration, on the way back, um, they all went over over the Gulf, not over the Caribbean. So two of them went down one way and back up another way, which is, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and then that uh, blue here in South America is where ceruleans spend um, the wintertime in the northern Andes of northern South America. So these aren't the big snow-capped, Andes that you sometimes think about in Chile or Argentina, these, these are sort of um, smaller Andes. They're kind of the foothills of the Andes. Uh, they look a lot like the Appalachians, actually, and I've got um, some pictures in a, in a few minutes. But um, coming back here to, to West Virginia for a minute, this picture is, is what I, when I picture cerulean warbler habitat, this is sort of what it looks like to me. It's a slope. There's Usually some gaps in the canopy so some sunlight gets in. There are some big old trees like the trees on the left that are just much bigger than the trees around them. And then there are some younger trees. Uh, there's some grape vines and other viney material, some ferns and stuff near the ground. And there's often, um, again, something like a small road that might create a, a, a little gap in the canopy. Ceruleans um, tend to uh, be around these canopy gaps. Um, especially along a ridge like this. Uh, and this is some notes to remind me. So ceruleans like slope in this part of the country. There has to be, you know, uh, they like fairly steep areas with a complex canopy. So gaps and again, some big trees some smaller trees. Uh, but there have to be some big trees uh, with diameter at rest height of 16 inches or greater. So if you think about 16 inches or greater, that's a pretty big tree. Um, there, there have to be some of those big trees um, in the forest for ceruleans to really uh, prefer, prefer that area. And some understory vegetation. There, again, some grapevines, um, some shrubs, some dogwood trees. Uh, they, they like some, um, some, some complex structure like that. Uh, this, this picture is taken in the Lewis Wetzel Wildlife Management Area, which is, uh, it actually, Wetzel County borders Ohio. Um, it's at the base of West Virginia's northern panhandle. Uh, it's a pretty low population county. Um, and interestingly, it doesn't look like this anymore. Uh, there, there's a lot of natural gas drilling happening in Wetzel County. And the, uh, a lot of the uh, nice small roads like this have been made into sort of bigger access roads, even in the wildlife management area. Um, which is sort of a topic of maybe another longer presentation, but uh, gas gas drilling in this region has, um, they've documented, the studies are coming out now that it has had a negative impact on interior forest songbirds, um, of course, uh, because it makes too, the, it uh, fragments the forest too much for them. But a, but a cerulean warbler may um, use something like a pipeline, like a, a cleared area for a pipeline or a power line cut, um, a size 
uh, a gap that's that big might be okay for a cerulean, but if you're getting a, a well pad uh, or something that's that's larger, it's too big of a gap for ceruleans to uh, to want to use. So, um, cerulean warblers, just some of these basic basic facts. They usually stay in the canopy. So if you're out bird watching, this is a bird that will give you a sore neck. You know, it's way up in the tops of the trees. Um, it's very, it can be very difficult to see. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're very small um, and tough to see up there. They're eating caterpillars, uh, spiders, leaf hoppers, um, other small insects. Uh, caterpillars are very important to a lot of warbler species, and they're very important to cerulean warblers as well. Um, when the when the pair is uh, courting each other, when the male is trying to you know convince the the female that you know we should have a nest together. Uh, the males will often um, bring the females caterpillars and feed them caterpillars uh, during that, you know, pair bonding. Um, so caterpillars are, are um, pretty important to cerulean warblers. They, these little guys only weigh 9 to 10 grams. So uh, 10 grams, it's about the weight of two nickels. Um, it's a very, very small bird. Um, if you if you want to compare that to something like a screech owl, uh, which is also pretty small, a screech owl can weigh about 200 grams. So a 10 gram bird is is uh, you know tiny. Their wings they can sometimes look like they have long wings if you're looking at them from beneath through your binoculars, but their wings are only two and a half inches long. Um, so 66 66 millimeter wings. Um, it's just a, an amazingly small bird that something this size can, you know, fly across the Gulf of Mexico twice a year. <laughs> kind of amazing. Uh, ceruleans have parallel white wing bars, too. So if you are ever in the situation where you can see a cerulean's wing bars, if you are, if the slope is such where you can look out and see them, you can see the parallel white wing bars. Uh, but often when I'm looking at ceruleans, it's like this. Um, this is the view I usually get, which is just from underneath, and you can you can see that uh, blue black uh, necklace of the male cerulean has, which is one of the things. If you see that thin necklace, you know you're looking at a cerulean. Um, other warblers with necklaces, um, a Canada warbler has a necklace, uh, and a, a magnolia warbler can sometimes have sort of a necklace, but those necklaces are blotchier and a lot larger than a cerulean has a thin thin blue black necklace uh, and again this is what you'll have to do when you're out bird watching and there's a cerulean above you uh, this is also southern West Virginia and this is the small the kind of small road that makes a little gap in the canopy and there is a male cerulean singing um, right over our head in this picture Another way you can look at ceruleans is just to, you know, lie down on your back on a road and and save your neck. Uh, it, it takes a little bit of getting used to at first, um, but once once you do it, you know, give it a try. You can you can save your neck and look up at the ceruleans in the trees and just check yourself for ticks afterwards. But uh, it's one of the best ways I've found um, to see ceruleans. And this is. Just a gorgeous photograph that I like to include just to show how blue that male's color is. This is not a photograph I have taken. Um, I've had, I have some friends who are really good photographers who send me the pictures and allow me to use them in presentations. The pictures that are, the photographs that are bad are ones that I have taken. Um, but that male, male cerulean warbler has got a blue that's, it's quite different from most other birds that are blue. Uh, it's, it's similar to a black-throated blue warbler, but um, a little bit lighter. Uh, there's there's nothing else that looks quite like a cerulean warbler. Um, I sh the two closest things I think are a black and black throated blue, uh, which again is a lot more black. And uh, I try to make a black and white warbler into a cerulean every spring. Um, and they they don't look that much alike, but when I have when I get ex really excited about ceruleans around this time in April and the black and whites come back, I start saying cerulean. Oh wait, black and white. <laughs> Um, again, in the hand, these birds are, are very tiny, but some, this, this picture I'm kind of showing to defend my black and white warbler confusion, you can see that some do have splotches of dark blue along their sides. So I'm not totally crazy. Um, they can look a little bit like a black and white warbler. 
Um, but of course, that blue black necklace um, is something that only the cerulean is going to have. So don't let the patches confuse you. Um, if you've got that blue black necklace, um, it can only really be a cerulean. Um, and again, uh, I just I can't get enough of these. Uh, you know, the faces on these little guys. This one even has some caterpillar juice maybe on his chin. Uh, often male ceruleans will do this um, drop wing, this kind of, they sort of drop their wings and flutter uh, when they are singing, perhaps perhaps um, trying to attract a mate or defend a territory or set up a territory. Uh, you can sometimes see them, they, they almost flutter fairly slowly. They almost look like they're having trouble sometimes when they flutter around with their wings dropped like this. But um, I have seen them doing this, you know, when they're, when they're singing, um, you know, when there's another male or female cerulean nearby. And then this, here's my photograph, <laughs> kind of blurry and out of focus, but this is one I've took. I've take, I took this photograph several years ago. This is a female cerulean warbler. Um, a lot more difficult to see. They're not singing out at the end of the branch like a male. Um, they blend in remarkably well with the leaves. They're sort of more of a turquoise color, not quite that bright blue, but they're sort of a, they almost look like an aquamarine. Maybe that's a better description than turquoise, sort of aquamarine or teal almost, uh, sort of like a washed out watercolor painting of a male cerulean. Uh, they don't often, they sometimes don't have a necklace or they have something that's maybe a hint of a necklace, but they do have parallel white wing bars. And here is a much better picture to kind of give you a sense of that color that I'm trying to describe, sort of an again, aquamarine. I have a Prius that's called sea foam green, and I think it's sort of, a, sort of the same color as a female cerulean warbler. Um, this picture... Uh, you might maybe can see the spider web in this photograph and this female cerulean warbler is probably she could be hunting for a spider in the spider web but they can also they also very often use spider webs in their nests uh, spider webs help hold uh, the nest material together so they will even they will take the female will gather spider web and sort of weave it around sticks and pieces of bark to help hold everything together, which is really pretty amazing. So this is another one of my photographs. This little clump of black right here is a cerulean warbler nest. <laughs> I don't expect you to actually be able to see what that looks like, but this picture might give you a sense of where um, a cerulean warbler nest is typically placed. So they're often about 30 feet from the ground, so their nests are pretty high and they're often on a horizontal branch and they're usually about halfway out uh, between the trunk and the end of the branch. So this nest is fairly typically placed as far as cerulean really warbler nests go. Uh, they're often attached to a little nub or a little twig or something on the branch. Um, and again, the female will use uh, grapevine, bark, um, lichens, uh, and spider webs to kind of hold that little nest together. And the female does uh, all of the nest building. Um, sometimes the male will kind of hop around and sing um, in an area where he thinks would be a good spot for the nest, but then the female does all of the, all of the building, all the constructing of the nest, and the female does all of the incubating of the eggs. Um, and this is different in some species, especially some large raptor species where the male and the female will take turns um, and share the duties of the incubating. Um, but ceruleans, the female, um, is the, the sitting, sitting duck, you know, the, the, the one who spends the time on the nest. Uh, she broods or she uh, incubates the eggs for, for about 10 to 12 days. Um, and then uh, the babies are in the nest um, for, uh, for another, another 12 days or so before they fledge. So it's a pretty, it's about a month that um, they're spending in the nest. Uh, which is that the female is spending in the nest, I should say. And then once the babies fledge after, you know, uh, 12 days, two weeks or so, then both parents will follow them around and feed them um, while they're learning how to be cerulean warblers, learning, figuring out what to eat. So, so now that we know um, something about uh, ceruleans, we could talk about, you know, why are they declining? Uh, why is this particular species in decline? 
Um, and uh, also, if you ever have been out bird banding, you may have seen uh, birds do this. When you take them out of the net, out of a mist net, they sort if you turn them on their backs, it's almost like they, um, you know, they 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 sit there for for a minute and then uh, zoom away after they realize they're oh I'm nothing's holding me anymore I can fly away. Uh, this particular cerulean warbler was part of a study where they were the biologists were putting um, color bands on the bird as well as the metal leg band with the unique federal number. So uh, oftentimes when people band birds, they just put that that metal band and that's with the number on it. However, the only way you can read that number is if you have the bird in the hand. So if the bird is uh, recaptured in a net or dead, then you'll be able to read the number. Otherwise, you can't really read the number on a bird as small as a cerulean. Sometimes, if it's you know, an eagle that you're looking at, uh, you might be able to read the number, but not on a cerulean warbler. So this biologist was putting uh, these, these light plastic bands in different, different patterns so they could just look through their binoculars at the bird and tell who it was. So this particular season, um, every cerulean warbler he banded this season um, had a red over silver on the right leg. And then on the left leg, they had different different color combinations. So he could even look at the bird and say, "Oh, that's a that's a red red over silver. I banded it, you know, this particular field season." So um, I was concerned about the birds flying, getting back with all that jewelry, you know, and and they are very very light, but the bird too is very light. Um, and uh, Greg George, the biologist, said that they recapture and re they recite and recapture birds, you know, in subsequent seasons after banding them, so they are able to make that make that big flight wearing the color bands. So I still was skeptical, but then I actually saw one that he had banded two seasons before. <laughs> so then I was I was convinced. So uh, why are the birds in decline? Well, like. Um, like with many species, unless there's a smoking gun reason um, like a pesticide or, or hunting or disease, uh, it's usually habitat loss. And that is what most people think about cerulean warblers also. Um, and unfortunately for ceruleans, that habitat loss is happening everywhere. Uh, it's it's it through all throughout its range. Um, and there there are some folks, some, some um, papers I've read that suggest that the habitat loss in the tropics may actually be uh, worse than the habitat loss in the breeding area. And that there, there are some areas uh, where it seems like we should have ceruleans during the breeding season, but they're not there, um, even though uh, they should be. You know, so they're, they're, it's, it's possible that that um, loss in the, in the non-breeding season is uh, having a, a big effect on them. Uh, or a, or a, a, a more than the habitat loss in the breeding, but I don't think we know that for sure. So this is my favorite kind of map. Um, if you have never, if you get on Birds of the World ever uh, or an eBird, this is cerulean warbler abundance throughout the year. So I'm going to play the map. So um, so watch where ceruleans go. Here's where they are in January, down in South America. Then in March and April, whoa, there they go. <laughs> And there they are uh, in the breeding season, and then shoom, they all go back. Uh, and if you ever want to see a huge contrast, you know, watch the cerulean warbler, you know, uh, migration, and then go to a go to the turkey vulture map, and watch the turkey vultures. <laughs> there are maybe 300 to 400 thousand cerulean warblers in the world, and there are probably close to 20 million turkey vultures. So the, the map looks quite a bit different, uh, the abundance map. But you might notice when you look at where they are in the tropics, they are in these bands. Um, they're not sort of covering, you know, Colombia, Venezuela, um, Ecuador. There are these bands, and those are mountains. Um, so they, they are in the mountains. Um, Colombia has three parallel mountain ranges, and ceruleans can be found on all three of the mountain ranges in Colombia. Um, kind of in the, the uh, middle elevations of those mountains. Oh, I didn't mean to make us watch it again, but it's, I could watch that all day. 
so I pulled up where, where you are, sort of near Cleveland. I, I pulled up um, sightings of cerulean warblers. And it looks like you have quite a few sightings um, around, uh, around, around where you are. Uh, ceruleans, of course, migrate, um, you know, across the, up to Canada, um, going through, uh, going through um, Ohio on the way to Canada. So you will definitely see ceruleans during migration, um, even if you don't see them uh, breeding. But they certainly do breed there also. So here in West Virginia, um, this is one of the uh, one of the reasons, one of the causes of habitat loss here: uh, deforestation and fragmentation. You know, including natural resource extraction. <laughs> And in this case, the natural resource being extracted is coal. Uh, this is called um, mountaintop removal, coal mining, or mountaintop mining. Um, it's called a couple different things in different parts of Appalachia, but uh, it's sort of strip mining on steroids. And what happens in, uh, in this kind of mine, um, a company will uh, go in and blow up some of the mountain to expose the coal seams. And you can kind of see it looks sort of like a layer cake. Uh, and then they'll scrape the coal seam and then they'll blow up a little bit more and to expose the next vein of coal. Um, scrape that, blow up a little bit more and scrape more until, uh, you know, until what you have left doesn't look like a mountain anymore. So uh, this particular picture is one I took. Um, this is in um, about 35 miles south of Charleston, West Virginia. And this is, again, right in the, right in the heart of cerulean warbler um, breeding habitat, right in the heart of their range. And you can see this is kind of a nice hardwood forest. Um, and this is a gap that is too big. <laughs> so where ceruleans like gaps, like where a big tree falls down or where there's a, a trail or something, um, this creates, this changes the landscape uh, on a very, very large scale. Um, this is this is what it sort of looks like from the edge of that same same mountain. They just create these. Uh, the topsoil's gone. Um, you know, the whole topography is is altered uh, of the of the former mountain, um, and you can't really put it back. Uh, there are um, the surface mining um, surface mine control and reclamation act of 1977, I believe. Um, told uh, mining companies that you had to put, you had to return the land to an um, approximate original contour when you were finished mining. You had to reclaim the land. Uh, unfortunately, that's not really possible when you remove the, the mountain, like when you change the, the geological you know, strata, you can't, you can't really put it back. So uh, you can apply for a variance um, if you can't put the mountain back. So I tried to figure out how many Mines in West Virginia have been granted, you know, variances under the Surface Mining Control uh, and Reclamation Act, and I couldn't get a straight answer. And someone sort of, you know, kind of <laughs> said to me one day, Katie, they all have variances because they can't, they can't put them back. They can't put the mountain back. And I don't know if that's true or not. I wasn't able to find out for sure. Uh, but what you can see in this picture, this is, um, there's some active mining going on, but there's also some reclamation. Uh, the terraced, kind of grassy terraced areas are valleys that have been filled in by the dirt and rock from the mountain after it was um, blown up. Uh, and this, of course, can be a problem with erosion. If you think about it, real you know, raining, um, the water rushing down the mountain, you would normally have creeks, you know, rivers, um, streams, you know, that there's even small streams that, you know, the water would all flow into a bigger body of water. Uh, but when you kind of fill in those streams, um, the water wants to go somewhere, uh, and if you have this all this loose loose dirt, um, you could have a real problem for the towns in the uh, in the valleys. Not to mention, you know, polluting the waterways. So a lot of the reclamation, um, the focus is preventing erosion because you know you want to prevent all that dirt and, and water rushing into your valley. Um, so uh, you compact the soil in those valleys, or the, the dirt, it's not really soil, uh, you hydro seed it, spray, um, spray seed on it so uh, grasses will grow. But it's very difficult for you to get a forest um, on something like this. 
Uh, if you want, there is a group called the Appalachian Regional Reforestation Initiative, and their mission is to kind of go into uh, former strip mines, former mountaintop removal mines, and kill the non-native grass species, um, churn up the dirt, uncompact the soil, bring in topsoil from somewhere else, and then hand plant trees. And apparently that can work. Uh, it's just expensive and pretty labor intensive to do. And then, of course, the elevation is not the same um, even after you reforest. So um, that's depressing. Uh, when we when you get to um, Central America, uh, the problem is still is still deforestation um, due to development in agriculture, uh, including coffee. So. Um, I believe that cerulean warblers at this point have been documented in every Central American country except El Salvador. I don't think they've been documented in El Salvador yet, but they at least pass through um, every Central American country on their way to on their way to South America. Some of them at least stop, but uh, the birds are only only passing through maybe two weeks in the spring and maybe two weeks in the fall, and then all the cerulean warblers are are gone one direction or the other. So it can be very, very difficult to know exactly where they go and to see them during migration. Um, they're not singing and they're in mixed species flocks with other really small, <laughs> really small birds. So it can be in a lot of these areas where you might want to go to, um, to, to see cerulean's in Central America during migration are, are uh, um, tough to get to. So, uh, but, but we know that at least some cerulean's stop at least some places in Central America. And this little guy is uh, at a coffee farm, Cafe Cristina, in Costa Rica. And you can buy um, Cafe Cristina coffee. Um, it's very good. Uh, and you can, visit, you can visit this coffee farm, too, um, in Costa Rica. Uh, the family um, is a, a bird-watching family. And they get ceruleans um, every year um, on their coffee farm. But again, only for, only for about two weeks out of the year. And uh, the... the uh, Ernesto Carmen um, is the one of the folks who owns the coffee farm, and he has a uh, he gives tours. Um, if you go to getyourbirds.org, you can hook up with Ernesto in Costa Rica and um, see if you can see some ceruleans. But they're only there uh, end of September, early October, uh, and then they're gone. So. Um, in the uh, winter range, when they get to South America, habitat loss there is similar um, deforestation due to agriculture, including coffee. So I mentioned coffee in Central America, but I didn't talk about it too much. I'm going to talk about it more here. Uh, you may recognize that's Juan Valdez, right? And uh, if you can see what's on his hat, that is a cerulean warbler on his hat. And his mule has a golden wing warbler. So uh, I was able to go to Colombia uh, to the Cerulean and Golden Wing Warbler Summit. And about the first part of the summit was held at the Coffee Federation headquarters, the Colombian Coffee Federation headquarters. Uh, that's, that's Juan Valdez is their mascot, uh, the mascot of the Colombian um, Coffee Federation. And they said, uh, you know, we don't want to be known as the destroyers of birds. And what they're talking about is uh, the way coffee is grown. So coffee is originally from Africa, but it grows well in other tropical regions um, of the world, like Central and South America. The traditional way that coffee was grown in South America, in, the, in Central America, was to leave the forest and grow the coffee shrubs in the shade of the forest canopy. Um, the coffee... Uh, there are, you don't need as many um, fertilizers, pesticides, uh, insecticides, things like that if you're growing the coffee in the shade of the forest canopy. Um, however, the coffee takes longer to grow if it's in the shade. If you cut down all the trees, the coffee will grow more quickly. So it really wasn't until, um, I believe, the 1960s, 1970s, that uh, folks in the trop, the coffee demand in the North America uh, increased dramatically, so a lot of the farmers started cutting down, um, cutting down the forests to grow the coffee in the full sun. Um, and the result of that, of course, is a loss of um, habitat for wildlife. Uh, it also forced people to uh, 
you know, convert their small family farm where they may have had a couple different kinds of crops to sort of one, you know, monoculture, uh, kind of like a cornfield but coffee. Um, that also, uh, also to grow coffee that way you have to often um, fertilize the soils, you know, spray for insects, where if you're growing the coffee under the shade of the forest canopy, um, you have sort of natural pesticides like birds to eat the insects um, off the coffee plants. So um, this is why uh, drinking bird-friendly or shade-grown coffee is important. And uh, one of the biggest surprises that it's been very surprising to me, giving talks about cerulean warblers to bird watching groups and Audubon groups, um, how few people had even heard of shade grown or bird friendly coffee before. Um, it's it's uh, for some reason it's not um, not something people know know a lot about. But bird friendly coffee, it's a it's a very easy way to conserve our migratory songbirds, and uh, it's just a, a consumer choice that you can make. So the Coffee Federation folks said, you know, we don't want to be known as the destroyers of birds. We love our birds. We don't want to destroy them uh, to grow our coffee. But if you want shade-grown coffee, you have to give us a market for it. There has to be a reason for us. To, we have to be able to sell it. We have to be able to turn a profit. Um, shade-grown coffee is a bit more expensive because it takes longer to mature. The, the, the beans take longer to, to grow on the plants. So uh, they can't folks can't pick the coffee and sell it as quickly. So it does, um, it, it does, is a little bit more expensive, but it's better tasting because the coffee is it's richer, the bean is on the plant longer. So, um, the next the next handful of pictures, the second part of my um, trip to the Cerulean and Goldwing Warbler Summit was to visit the Cerulean Warbler Reserve. Uh, you might look at, notice the bird on that sign it has two parallel white wing bars and a, a necklace. So this is the Cerulean Warbler Reserve. It's 550 acres in uh, northeastern Colombia. Uh, and it's, it's the first Latin American reserve dedicated to a bird that breeds in North America. And uh, a lot of the reserve is Colombian oak forest. And then uh, some of the reserve is uh, shade-grown coffee or coffee, coffee plots that they are trying to restore to shade-grown. Um, and I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So this is some of the intact forest. Uh, it was just incredible to walk through. And if you think about the pictures from a few minutes ago of what you know the forest looks like in West Virginia, um, it's not altogether different. There are some large trees, some smaller trees, some vines, some um, some understory vegetation. Here's one of these big kind of super emergent trees and uh, you know different species of trees than we have here in West Virginia, but the slope was similar. Um, the feeling in the forest was very similar. Um, again, large trees, smaller trees, and a lot of understory vegetation and some vines. Um, rocky outcrops. I mean, it was it was a again a very similar feeling to the forest in West Virginia, except there we were looking at species like toucanets, um, you know, or pendulas, and uh, a lot of different tanagers. Um, different species than we have here, but uh, the forest had a very similar feel. Um, so shade grown coffee, this is an infographic that I took that I've took, taken from the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. So bird friendly shade looks like a forest. So that all the way on the right is what bird friendly shade would look like. Partial shade, um, where you might keep a few trees or some fruit trees but cut down most of the forest to grow the coffee. Uh, it's, there are still birds in partial shade, and there even are still birds in sun-grown coffee. But if you look at the, the species, this is from their fieldwork in Peru, you, might, you only would have 61 species, which still sounds like a lot to me, in the sun-grown coffee plots, but in the bird-friendly shade-grown coffee plots, you would have 243 bird species. Uh, the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center is usually considered um, the strictest certifier of coffee. Uh, if, if you buy coffee with that Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center decal on it that says bird friendly, you can be confident that the coffee you're getting protects songbird habitat. And I'll show you what that, in a couple of slides, I'll show you what that certification looks like. Um, this is what a coffee plot, coffee growing in the full sun would look like, where you would take 
the forest, like in the, you know, forest that looked like this, and you cut it all down, you're left with something that looks like this. So this is coffee growing in the full sun. Um, there are banana trees and trees with plantains kind of lining a lot of the coffee plots, um, but obviously there aren't any big, big trees here, um, nothing that looks like a forest. Uh, this coffee plot's a little bit better. It has you still it has some trees left over the coffee shrubs, and some of these plots here in these pictures, um, the plan is to let these trees grow and to plant more trees to kind of reforest this particular um, part of Colombia. But it will take a while. Trees take a long time to grow often. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, but this is still not what you would normally picture when you think of shade-grown coffee. Um, this is, again, another plot where the trees are, are a little bit older, a little bit bigger, but here you've got coffee shrubs, um, banana trees, you know, and some, some larger, uh, larger trees where, where you might have birds like ceruleans. And I saw um, a cerulean warbler in a plot that looked something like this one when I was there in one of these uh, large trees. Um, but this particular, this particular tree um, I, I took a picture of it because we saw so many species of birds in this one tree. It was one of the uh, largest trees, tallest trees. You can see the banana trees over on the right, and this tree just kind of towered above them and had, I think we had like 12 species of birds in this one tree, including a turquoise dacnes. Um, they may have changed the name to a turquoise dacnes tanager, uh, but it, it was a Colombian endemic, and it was my, the best bird I saw on this trip. It was really amazing. So um, field work in Colombia and bird watching in Colombia in shade grown bird friendly coffee farms in Colombia are a lot of the species that, that breed here in North America that are some of like our favorite species. Um, Broadwing hawks will hunt in coffee farms. Um, Eastern wood peewees, Acadian flycatchers, Swainson's thrush, red-eyed vireo, cerulean warbler of course, uh, black burnian warbler, yellow warblers, black and white warblers, Tennessee warblers. <laughs> Summer tanagers, um, rose-breasted grosbeaks, you know, and and more. And the list just goes on of um, of our birds that may spend the winter in a shade-grown coffee farm in Colombia. Uh, this picture I like to include here just because it shows. It looks like you could be looking at West Virginia. Uh, I mean, it's a very similar feel. It's a, it's the hills are not not the the peaks mountain peaks are somewhat somewhat rounded. They're not very sharp, and they're um, are forested and the towns are, are there in the valleys. So uh, when I went to Columbia, um, I w uh, I had, when I was part of this summit, there was a, a migratory bird festival going on in the town of San Vicente de Chucuri. And these are kids, they had a parade for migratory bird festival. And the kids in the parade dressed as cerulean warblers and golden wing warblers. And it was just amazing. Um, the teachers were making them flap their wings and stuff like that and I mean my face hurt from smiling so much. It was just really amazing to see um, the whole town kind of come out to celebrate um, their migratory bird day. Um, of course, Columbia, I was um, pretty nervous before traveling there. Uh, Columbia has, you know, the reputation for, you know, people getting kidnapped and being dangerous. Um, it's, it's, my belief is that it gets less and less dangerous all the time. I went in 2000, it was 2008 when I went, and uh, there, were, there was a, a military presence um, near our group, and I learned later that uh, there's always military presence around some areas, but we had some folks in our group who work for a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so work for the U.S. government, um, which may have been a little bit higher risk than just regular, <laughs> regular Americans. So... Uh, there were some folks, um, military folks around. They were intimidating at first, but then they would, you know, talk on their cell phones or listen to their iPods. And um, one guy let me hold his assault rifle, uh, which is probably against the rules. But um, they were, you know, everybody was very, very friendly. And I didn't have um, any sort of bad experiences at all. And the kids were, um, were really wonderful. Uh, Colombia has more bird species than any other country on the planet. Um, I think they're up to maybe 1,700, 1,800 and some bird species, which is really, really amazing. And I would, I would go back, um, I would go back if I could. I, I really, really want to go back someday and uh, go birding in a different part of Colombia because 
the people are wonderful and there are so many birds, <laughs> including cerulean warblers. So I'm um, getting to the end here. Uh, so what you can do to help cerulean warblers. Often we talk about you know, lo the loss of songbirds. It's very depressing. <laughs> but there are some things we can do as lovers of birds. And the very, very easiest thing we can do is to purchase shade-grown coffee from Central or South America. So uh, even though uh, ceruleans overwinter in South America, uh, they still pass through Central America and do stop in shade-grown coffee farms there. And a lot of our other, you know, very beloved birds will just spend the entire winters in the coffee farms in Central America. So the wood thrush is a species that doesn't go to South America. You know, it stops in Central America. Um, and uh, they do use coffee farms when they are in Central America. So it's hard to find shade grown coffee sometimes. I buy it online because none of our local stores carry it. Um, I usually buy birds and beans coffee which is just from birdsandbeans.com, and it's often available at nature stores. This is what the old logo used to look like for bird-friendly coffee. You may still see this some places, uh, but they then they revised it to bird-friendly habitat, uh, but they revised it again. So this is the current bird-friendly logo with the Smithsonian uh, kind of sunburst. So if you see bird friendly, this logo on coffee, you can be very confident that the coffee uh, is providing habitat for birds. Uh, it has to also be organic, USDA organic, to be to, to get the bird friendly certification. Um, and a lot of USDA organic bird friendly coffee is also fair trade. Birds and beans is fair trade, bird friendly, and USDA organic. So um, it's it can be expensive to get those certifications. Uh, but it's it's um, worth it for the birds. Uh, you can also support alternatives um, to mountaintop removal, coal mining, and other deforestation, which is could be a little tougher than just buying a certain brand of coffee. Um, coal mining, mountaintop removal, coal mining uh, has been in decline in West Virginia over the last maybe maybe 10 years, um, and it's just kind of a mixed bag because. Uh, natural gas is increasing, and that's part of the reason that coal mining has decreased. Um, natural gas has some things that are better than coal, uh, but from a cerulean warbler um, habitat standpoint, you're still, in many cases, deforest, deforesting, cutting down uh, trees to put in to put in well pads and other infrastructure that um, might be in cerulean warbler habitat. Uh, you can you can try to manage your forest for cerulean warblers. Um, there, if you go to the Appalachian Mountain Joint Venture uh, website, which is right there, and um, search for cerulean warbler uh, forest management, you can download a document that can give you instructions on how to manage your forest if you have if you own a large chunk of private forest. Um, some of the suggestions are to leave your white oaks and leave your sugar maples and chestnut oaks and to remove uh, red maples um, and to try to create some canopy gaps. So if you have a big chunk of forest, you might um, check out that website and see if you can manage your forest for ceruleans. Uh, and also supporting organizations that fund songbird conservation research is important. And everyone um, does that, uh, is doing that already if you're a member of a bird club, right? A lot of um, bird clubs are chapters of larger organizations that do that fund songbird conservation research. Uh, a lot of it comes from the federal government, of course, but um, other conservation groups will um, fund research to uh, help songbirds, to learn more about songbirds. And also, when in, in non-pandemic times, uh, if Traveling to areas known to have ceruleans uh, or other bird species and tell people like you're, you've traveled to their town because you want to see birds, birds are good for business, I think is a really good message that bird watchers can probably do a better job conveying. Um, I know that I'm guilty of, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't always tell people I'm here to see your birds, <laughs> but uh, it might be good, a good practice. So. Um, thank you very much for for listening. Uh, this is going to be the cover of my book, and then someone said they thought it looked like a cookbook cover, like we were going to eat the bird. So we didn't we didn't we didn't use this uh, we didn't use this one. 
but if, if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. I just uh, wanted to say, Katie, um, it seemed like you were almost, you know, the your choice to pursue this interest, did it seem to you like you were kind of along a wave of good research and um, people working together so that you, you know, your interest was, uh, you know, just so expanded because of so much what was going on for the Ceruleans? Yes. Um, because of that, there, because there was that petition, I think, to list the cerulean as a threatened species, um, mm -hmm. and because people noticed that the bird was in decline, there, uh, there was a research interest. You know, there was a lot of research coming out in the, uh, that's actually still coming out um, on cerulean warblers. And I, it seemed like it really got started, I feel like the 1990s maybe is when people started to talk about the paper, I, used, I started to see the dates, um, ni early 1990s, people started talking about ceruleans being in decline. And then it was early 2000s um, when people really seemed to, the research seemed to have a big uptick um, trying to learn more about the species. And it's still, uh, the research into trying to figure out, learn more about ceruleans and how we can, you know, manage habitat for them and how we can, uh, conserve the species. The research is still going on um, every day. I just listened to a master's student give a presentation on his research on uh, how ceruleans are responding to private forest management for them. Um, so now we're sort of at the stage where we had to sort of, or the researchers had to kind of figure out what habitat ceruleans preferred and then they had to try to figure out, uh, how, can we do that? Can we manage that ha habitat for them and how? And then they had to go in and make those changes to the habitat. And now they're sort of at the stage where they're trying to figure out how ceruleans are responding to those, to that management. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there's, there, there will still be, you know, a lot of research going on trying to figure out more about this bird. It's a, a tough bird to study. Um, mm -hmm. And it's tough to study it in the tropics when it's very small, not singing, uh, and a lot of the areas are very remote. And in places like Colombia, you know, it was dangerous to be a bird researcher. Um, it still is dangerous to be. They had, um, I think, a few months ago, there was a high-profile biologist who was murdered in Colombia. Oh. And oh. It's, uh, you know, you might literally be risking, you know, risking your your life to go into some of these areas. Um, oh dear! Wow. But the other side of, and then another thing to consider, which is sort of, it sounds lighthearted, but it's, I don't mean to sound lighthearted, but some of these guerrilla groups in places like Colombia preserved preserved the forest because people didn't go there. Um, however, uh, Colombia uh, had a big problem with landmines. Um, because as these guerrilla groups sort of de uh, decommissioned or or whatever whatever you say it um, disbanded, they would sometimes um, leave leave things like landmines behind, uh, which can also be quite dangerous if you're walking through remote areas of the forest trying to study birds. So um, it's a difficult bird to study, and. Uh, but it's a very beautiful, charismatic bird. I mean, there's nothing quite like a, a cerulean warbler. So hopefully, we'll continue to learn learn about them. Uh, also, in my experience, um, I'm you know not a not an official biologist. I'm just I'm a writer who just likes birds, and uh, the the cerulean warbler community of researchers and biologists were wonderful, amazing, nice people. Um, who uh, welcomed me tagging along and recording them and <laughs> asking all kinds of questions and they even let me do things like hold birds. So uh, it, it was a really great experience. It still is a great experience. It seems like it seems like you made a, a lot of friendships and had fun and and worked worked very hard. Oh yes, yes, it was a lot of fun. Yep, and I'm so glad I got to go to Columbia also. Um, it was yeah. a really great experience. I really, I really do hope I can go back. It was really wonderful. 
Well, thank you. I really, I really enjoyed your book and learning more about it and seeing these pictures tonight was great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I love talking about ceruleans. <laughs> and should I, shall I stop sharing my screen? I have to, um, I'm not quite sure how to do that. Betsy probably knows. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm so glad that you brought in the, the uh, shade-grown coffee component. You know, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society sells um, uh, the birds and beans coffee on the website store. Excellent. And has been doing so for a number of years. but And it's so delicious. Once you try it, you won't really won't want to drink anything else. Yes, absolutely. I only drink um, bird friendly coffee. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. Yeah, <laughs> birds and beans is great. Uh, mm -hmm. Very nice, very nice folks too who run the run the company. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I I um uh, I'm I'm one of the one of birds and beans uh, voices for the birds. Oh. Um, <laughs> So they will, uh, uh, occasionally I will go out and sort of talk about coffee um, on behalf of Birds and Beans. Um, and my, um, my, our nonprofit, um, Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, sells, sells Birds and Beans um, as a fundraiser. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's great coffee. It, I'll, I'll, I, I don't even have a favorite roast because they're all good. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. It was. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me.